All right, this is the sixth lecture in Chapter 16, Chapter 17, Renewable Resources and some Non-Renewables. Uh, just looking at the production of other types of fuels, some renewable resources. We can look at corn or ethanol as far as using that as an energy source. But interestingly, if we look at this little bullet point here, if we use every bit of corn that we ever had, or have right now, uh, it really wouldn't add that much to the mix. So it's something that can supplement and kind of increase our supply line, but it's not something we can just switch over to and rely upon. It's not that kind of a resource. Geothermal, very interesting. Um, one we don't typically think about pursuing, but we can do this anywhere. Um, there's two different types of geothermal that are out there. There's one that they use, for example, in countries like Iceland, where they have a high thermal output based on the proximity, I guess you'd say, of magma to the surface. And they can put pipes down there and grab that high heat content and pull it right to the surface and use it. Uh, a different kind, which is much more likely for places like here, would be that you know the soils around here in Michigan, if you go down a few feet, like your basement, it's probably about 50 some odd degrees down there. We can actually put pipes down there with fluid, take that temperature, take that water heated temperature, and extract the heat content from it. You don't have to take a lot, but then concentrate that heat content and then utilize that as a heat source through pressurize, pressurizing the system. So you can compress the heat content and use it and then in this, the opposite in the summer you can take heat from within your house and dump it into the ground. It again has a very high, not very, but it has a somewhat high startup cost, but once the system is in place, it's relatively cheap. And again, the overall energy in comparison to what you're dumping CO2 into the atmosphere is really, really low. And it's all self-contained on your property. So when you add up all of the costs, it's, I would say it's probably pretty close to breaking even. This is kind of a pictorial of what that would look like, having a system in your house with a bunch of tubing that goes out. In the winter time, you would have these hot coils running out, bringing cold coils back in and just the opposite in the summer. <clears throat> and I believe we have a little video here, and again, you can watch this on your own. So moving over to another energy source is the fuel cells or hydrogen. Uh, this is another one of those holy grails of energy resources that's out there is again the resource itself is simply water if you can split water into hydrogen and oxygen you can utilize that hydrogen in your car instead of gasoline and the only output would be water so it's a pretty good resource to, to use but we haven't figured out we're probably still Every 10 or 15 years, we're about 15 years away from doing it. So we haven't figured out how to do it yet. But here's a little pictorial of kind of what it would look like. You can pause this and take a look at it on your own. Uh, the, I like this little pictorial here. It kind of shows back, you know, 200 years or so ago. And makes a comparison to where we have been and where we are. So if you went back to 1800, the very much primary resource that we had was wood. And then eventually we switched over to coal, and we used coal for quite a long time. And then eventually, in about 1950, um, oil has taken over as far as the predominant resource that we have. But we see that that's starting to go away. But what we look at for the future, for the extended time period, 75 years or so, we're looking at natural gas as being our, our predominant energy resource. So I'm not sure everything that goes into play with that. It certainly has a large supply. So that probably has a lot to do with it, and it's probably the easiest one to go after. But notice it again with the hydrogen solar, using solar energy to generate hydrogen, mostly for transportation, um, or your home. These are both really good resources to use after oil and coal are no longer economically feasible, or at least if you're looking at uh, reducing carbon dioxide. <clears throat> So as far as government, we really have to look at as far as um, pursuing policies that really limit the amount of fossil fuels that we're using and using things that are more sustainable. And this really requires a government push. 
Something else that we mentioned is in the future is instead of having these centralized systems that get energy from these large particular locations and then they ship it out all over, they're saying they should have smaller power plants that are more able to meet demand and not have to transport energy to such large distances. Um, and also it allows you as a consumer to put energy back into the system and feed the network. And this is sort of the, the idea of how that would work with all these different systems putting energy in, selling it back and forth, almost like it's a commodity. Instead of just one particular location selling it out, we would have all these different resources that can produce energy on their own and distribute. So something I mentioned earlier, as far as our energy policy right now is very heavily influenced um, based on a lot of politics, subsidies into the system, tax breaks that are out there that really determine why we use, for example, a lot more oil than the rest of the world. Um, it has a lot to do with the profit and the people that are profiting from it. There's a lot of politics that go into it. Um, we really should be somewhere else, but here we are. <clears throat> And here's a last slide that we have here, just kind of looking at, again, uh, some of the different uh, things that we could do to limit the amount of energy that we consume and just say, again, to try to pursue a more sustainable approach. So that's it. That's our last slide.